got my arms out, I got my head up, he gets to my feet and he's coming back up my body and he poses the question, what's your plan, little man? I said, man, I'm going D1, I'm going to college. He said, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. And he went to walk off. I walked with him. I tapped his arm. He turned around. I said, you got the wrong guy. He said, no, I know about you. Sarcasm kicks in. He said, didn't you have two uncles that came to the same school? I said, yes, sir. He said, weren't they little athletes just like you? Like people talked about them and how they could play sports and all that? I said, yes, sir. He said, aren't they serving 13 and 40 years at the federal penitentiary, not even 10 minutes away from these front doors? I said, yes, sir. He said, absolutely. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You'll probably end up in cell block D1. Walked off. I walked with him. <laughs> I tapped his chest. He turned around. I said, I'm telling you got the wrong guy he said we'll see I said we will and I had this dream that man if I could just make it to the NFL I could get my mother off of that double shift at Wendy's like man if I can make it to the NFL me and my cousins we won't have to miss meals if I could just make it to that NFL man everything would make sense and when I got my scholarship from Tennessee you know the first person I went to see that cop I went to him and he said something to me and it rang so true. I slid my paper across the table to him and he stood up and he said, I want to ask you a question. How did you do it? He said, every kid that comes in these doors, they say that, but they end up selling drugs across the street at the gas station or they end up going to prison, going to jail. Like everybody wants something out of life. He said, the reason I said that to you, he said, I want you to understand something. I'm here every day. He said, the only reason I said it to you, he said, I wasn't even trying to break you. I just wanted to see would you be willing to fight for the thing that you said you wanted when somebody came at you and they tried to crush you and say, because of your family history, because of your lineage, you're probably gonna end up just like them. I wanted to see would you be willing to fight for what you said you wanted. Coming into my junior year, I get my paperwork back from the NFL and I'm a projected first round draft pick. Who knew? Kid from a two bedroom home, 14 people. Now come out my first game, have a great game, and the quarterback just so happens to drop back and he releases the ball to a guy coming down my sideline. And as soon as I made contact with the guy, I knew something was wrong. It seemed as if every breath of my body left, my body went completely limp. I fell to the ground, I blacked out. That had never happened to me before. My eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. They said, ain't get up, let's rock, let's close it out, let's go. I said, I can't. There's a shock going from my neck to my toes, I can't feel anything. And I remember they brought the spine board out, put me on it, they're willing me off to the field. Doctors came running from the opposite side and the lead doctor says, guys, get in here, we gotta rush this kid back to emergency surgery, he's about to die. You ruptured up some clavian artery in your chest, you're bleeding internally. We don't take you back and perform surgery right now. He said, you won't be here in the morning. And the game of football on my scale of life was that big. The NFL, hmm, that big. And I'm like, man, Ink, was that it? Like, that's all you really wanted? Was a contract from the NFL? That was it? I was embarrassed. I just got up every day, went through drills, and man, I'm gonna make it to the NFL. That's a be, that'll be it. No value, no substance, nothing. There's a quote that says, when do a person start to really live? When a person has encountered death. Now, I'd encountered death and I had survived it. And I guarantee you, it was literally as if somebody pulled the shades up on my life and they said, now you see life for what it's really worth. You thought it was about the NFL. Now you really see life for what it's really worth. Like, I thought I was driven when I played sports, but man, every day I get up that drive different. Like every single day, I get up to impact life. That is why I go at life with the drive, the dedication, and the commitment level that I do. And when adversity, opposition, and the thing that should have crushed me, I step back, I embrace it and say, life, that's all you got. This was your best shot. And I find it amazing, man, how in life, people say, man, I'm going to do something. I'm on fire. I'm committed to it. But a change in circumstance 
a change in situation. I don't get what I thought I was going to get. Now the mission that they once set out on to change the world or impact people, it means nothing to them. As long as what you do and what you're connected to serves a greater purpose than just yourself, son, you will always trample the opposition. You will always trample the adversity. You will always trample the challenges of life. One thing about it, character is not something that you're born with. Character is something that you get up every single day, you fight and you build it. And every single day the process is happening constantly in life through opposition, through adversity, and through challenges. At the end of the day it's about who we become and it's about what we did. Go get it. When I walked out here, I gotta be honest, I was pretty nervous. I hope I didn't, you know, bomb this. <laughs> you know, because last time what happened? So on the screen you were going to see my best friend, my wife Kelsey. She winds up uh, telling me with excitement and fear that she's pregnant. Nine months go by and my daughter's born. And the reason I know that my wife is the best in the world is because when I looked at my wife and I said, what do you want to name her? You think Madison or Avery? She looked at me and said, no, we have to name her Chloe Lynn, don't we? And I said, we don't have to do that. Why would you even think that? And she said, because you idiot. You already got your ex-girlfriend's name tattooed on your arm. Yeah. So we named her after my ex-girlfriend. It's not true. It's not true. No, my ex-girlfriend's the devil, but it's on. So everything's going my way. I'm coming up with my third deployment. I gotta go over to Afghanistan for my third time. Start putting our stuff on like normal. As we're going over what we're gonna do, we're strapping our gear on. We go out with the minesweeper and we start sweeping the ground back and forth. Back and forth, nothing alarms us or anything there. I take my backpack off and I set it on the ground. It hits the ground and underneath it is a bomb. And it takes my right arm, right leg automatically. They rush me into surgery, right? We're gonna fast forward into the surgery here. And they cut my left leg off because it's already gone. And then two days later, they have to cut my left arm off because the skin and neck are tied. So I'm a quadruple amputee. Three days later, I arrived at Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland. My wife came up to me, right? And I saw her. And when I finally got the chance to talk to her, I said, Kelsey, you don't have to do this. Take the house, take the cars, take whatever money we have saved up and go. This is not the life I would choose for you. And she thought about it and she said, you know, I was thinking that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then she came around and she said, you know what? Handicap parking sounds enticing. I'm, I'm going to stay. But if you can imagine, she actually at 23 and I'm 25 and our daughter, six months old, said, you know what, I'm going to be here. We're going to get through this together. So I'm at Walter Reed and I'm trying to recover. I had to find motivation, but I find motivation in my wife and my daughter. And all of a sudden there's a brotherhood at Walter Reed. A robot walked into my room and the first thing out of this guy's mouth was, hey man, welcome to the club. I said, I want to be in your club. He said, kind of late now, don't you think? I said, oh, you got me there. And his name was Todd Nicely and he showed me that with hard work and determination, I could walk again. And two things went off. Number one, this guy showed me the way that I can get better. I can still be there for my family. And number two, he's a Marine. And if a Marine can do it with how dumb they are, you know. So the things I wanted to accomplish, I wanted to be able to feed myself again. I wanted to be able to pick a fork up and put food in my mouth. You see, I, I couldn't do that for five weeks. At five weeks, I was out of my recovery stage enough where I was healed up and I could grab a fork. I also was tired of sitting in a wheelchair. I thought, you know what, I want to be able to walk again. So seven weeks and four days into my recovery, I took my very first steps at Walter Reed. It was very painful, it was not easy. And as I was walking around the track, they said, you'll walk one lap today. And I went ahead and walked three laps that day. And when I got done, I sat down, took a breather, and realized this could be something that I do. Now the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, is my hand. Now, this thing's the coolest thing in the world. On the screen, you're gonna see the most important hand that I own, right there. It's not the one I'm wearing. No, that one. That one's called a Greifer. That hand is in a Crown Royal bag on the top shelf of my closet. Yeah, and nobody touches that hand because that hand closes 25 pounds of pressure. And you see, my daughter is seven years old. Yeah, in nine years, Johnny's gonna come knocking at the door. <laughs> and he's gonna be like, hey bro, <laughs> like, did you just bro me, Johnny? That's 25 pounds of pressure. He's like, ah, oh, dude, that hurts. Johnny, there's no strike two and three. This is two and three right here. <laughs> Crunch. I break his hand. I know, sad. He's like, let me go. Let me go. I pull Johnny close. I don't let him go. No. 
I say, Johnny, guess what? <laughs> I don't know what. No fingerprints, Johnny. <laughs> Remember that, Johnny. When I got blown up and I was down and out and I was wondering why did this happen, I was embarrassed, I was angry, I was questioning am I a bad person, does God hate me? And the biggest question I honestly had, ladies and gentlemen, was why didn't I just die? Why did I live through this? I was 18 years old when I got married. I belonged to a very conservative family, a Baloch family, where good daughters never say no to their parents. My father wanted me to get married. And all I said was, if that makes you happy, I'll say yes. And of course, it was never a happy marriage. Just about after two years of getting married, about nine years ago, I met a car accident. Somehow my husband fell asleep and the car fell in the ditch. He managed to jump out, saved himself. I'm happy for him. But I stayed inside the car and I sustained a lot of injuries. The list is a bit long. Radius ulna of my right arm were fractured. The wrist was fractured. Shoulder bone and collarbone were fractured. My whole ribcage got fractured. But that injury that changed me and my life completely was the spine injury. Many people came to rescue. They gave me CPR. They dragged me out of the car. And while they were dragging me out, I got the complete transaction of my spinal cord. Those two and a half months in the hospital were dreadful. I was at the verge of despair. One day doctor came to me and he said, well, I heard that you wanted to be an artist, but you ended up being a housewife. I have a bad news for you. You won't be able to paint again. Next day doctor came to me and said, your spine injury is so bad. You won't be able to walk again. I took a deep breath and I said, it's all right. Next day, doctor came to me and said, because of your spine injury and the fixation that you have in your back, you won't be able to give birth to a child again. That day, I was devastated. I started to question my existence. Why am I even alive? So what kept me going was, one day I asked my brothers, I know I have a deformed hand, but I'm tired of looking at these white walls in the hospital and wearing these white scrubs. Bring me some colors, bring me some small canvas. I want to paint. So the very first painting I made was on my deathbed, where I painted for the very first time. What an amazing therapy it was. Without uttering a single word, I could paint my heart out. I could share my story. People used to come and say, what lovely painting so much color nobody could see the grief in it only I could and that day I decided that I'm going to live life for myself I am not going to be that perfect person for someone I am just going to take this moment and I will make it perfect for myself that I'm going to fight my fears so I wrote down one by one all those fears and I decided that I'm going to overcome these fears one at a time you know what was my biggest fear divorce but the day I decided that this is nothing but my fear I liberated myself by setting him free and I made myself emotionally so strong that the day I got the news that he's getting married I sent him a text that I'm so happy for you and I wish you all the best and he knows that I pray for him today number two was I won't be able to be a mother again and that was quite devastating for me but then I realized there are so many children in the world, all they want is acceptance. So there is no point of crying, just go and adopt one. And that's what I did. I gave my name in different organizations, different orphanages, and I waited patiently. Two years later, I got this call from a very small city in Pakistan. I got a call and they said, are you Muniba Mazari? There is a baby boy and would you like to adopt? I could literally feel the labor pain. I said, yes, yes, I am going to adopt him. I am coming to take him home. And that day, Nile was two years old, two days old and today he's six. You know when you end up being on the wheelchair, what's the most painful thing? People think that they will not be accepted by the people because we 
in the world of perfect people are imperfect. So I decided to appear more in public. I started to paint. I have done a lot of modeling campaigns. I decided that I'm going to join the national TV of Pakistan as an anchor person. I became the national goodwill ambassador for UN Women Pakistan and now I speak for the rights of women children. I was featured in BBC 100 Women for 2015. I'm one of the Forbes 30 under 30 for 2016. So when you accept yourself the way you are, the world recognizes you. It all starts from within. We have this amazing fantasy about life. This is how things should work. This is my plan. It should go as per my plan. If that doesn't happen, we give up. I never wanted to be on the wheelchair. Never thought of being on the wheelchair. This life is a test and a trial and tests are never supposed to be easy. So when you are expecting ease from life and life gives you lemons, then you make the lemonade and then do not blame life for that. It is okay to be scared. It is okay to cry. Everything is okay, but giving up should not be an option. They always say that failure is not an option. Failure should be an option because when you fail, you get up and then you fail and then you get up and that keeps you going. Embrace each and every breath that you are taking. Celebrate your life. Live it. Don't die before your death. Real happiness lies in gratitude. So be grateful, be alive, and live every moment. It still haunts me to this day. It was a shriek. Yeah, I grew up in this really normal, beautiful, middle-class family. My father was 35 years old. He was the breadwinner of the family. My mom was a homemaker. That was the role in the 1970s. She stayed at home, raised the kids. I don't know if you can relate with this, but my dad was my hero. Not everybody has that kind of dad, but my dad was my hero. He was a hockey coach. He was a baseball coach. He was the kind of man that you wanted to be your best for. And I felt in his shadow I could do or be anything. And I felt loved and accepted. In, uh, in August 1975, I remember the, the night the priest from the local parish came and knocked on our door and I, I remember it because I remember the sound that my mom made. And it, it still haunts me to this day, it was a shriek, a horror. Because all of a sudden our world completely turned inside out literally in one day. What happened within a year is mom remarried and the man that she hooked up with was a violent, abusive alcoholic. And so I went from a message of you're loved and you can do and be anything to you're stupid, you're dumb, you'll never amount to anything. And I was eight and I honestly I didn't know how to process that. I began to believe lies about who I was and how I fit into the world. Shortly after my ninth birthday, uh, an opportunity presented itself to, to do drugs for the first time. By the time I was 15 years old, I was non-compliant at home. I, I grew an extra two feet. Not so good for my stepfather. There was a lot of tension between him and I, and he paid the bills, so I had to go. For me, it was jumping out of the pot and straight into the fire. At 15 years old, I was on my own. So just try and get through another sunset. At 16 years old, I began getting in trouble with the legal system. I remember going back out to the street, completely broken as a human being, walking up East Hastings with the pouring rain. And I said to myself, how did I get here? I'm a good kid from a good family. How did I end up in this much trouble? What ended up happening is I remember uh, this, the day, it was a beautiful sunny day just like today. See, back in those days, I was, um, I was a liar, a thief, a cheat, and a mooch. And uh, I landed in this park and I saddled up beside this guy sitting at a bus stop named Gus because he had a cigarette. And he gave me a cigarette, he was a really nice guy. And he gave me a couple bucks too. But he gave me something more. The entire time I was sitting there talking to him, Gus said to me, he says, you know, Joe, he says, there's more to you than you can see. He said, but life has kind of dirtied your windows and so the light doesn't get in and your light doesn't get out. 
you could go on to do extraordinary things because you're a real bright guy. I remember when he was talking to me and he was speaking his truth into my life, I was looking over my shoulder for someone else. Because what stood before him did not align with his words. But he said to me, he said, there's more to you than you can see. And I remember my heart absolutely sank. For years of my life, I didn't take accountability for my own actions. I blamed society, I blamed my stepfather, I blamed everybody else except me. And that, that kept me from actually taking responsibility for my own behavior in my own life. I deflected it. But on that moment, the miracle happened for me. And the miracle was that I became teachable, I became pliable, and I became willing to do just about anything. You know, one of the things that I know today is that discontentment is the catalyst of change. And what I mean by that, it's oftentimes not until we're, we're backed into a corner where we become teachable, where we become willing to do something different. But you see, possibility always exists. It never goes away. It's always present. Even at my lowest point, the possibility of transformation was there. I started to flower. I started to come out and I started to do incredibly well. I went from a kid pushing a shopping cart to just try and get through another sunset to being on the cover of Canadian business. Because inside every single one of us is infinite possibility. And she says the most offensive thing to me that you can say to a person of color in the United States of America, she asks me, were you born in this country? And I was immediately offended. I put my hands on my hips and I said, yeah, I was born in this country. She then goes on to ask me, how old are you? I said, 19 years old. She says, are you married? I said, no, ma'am. She says, do you have any kids? I said, no, ma'am. May I help you find something? She then goes on to tell me something that changed my life forever. She says, you look like you could be the next Miss USA. And I laughed at this woman hysterically. I said, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, a, I'm going into my sophomore year at Virginia State. I'm about to commission in three years, go on active duty, be a military officer. Somehow, this crazy woman convinced me to meet her at Starbucks the very next day. She brought this foot-tall stack of pageant books, and she goes on to convince me to compete in my very first pageant. I compete in my first pageant three months later, and I lose. I go back the second year, compete in my state pageant, and I lose. I go back the third year, compete in my state pageant, and I lose. Go back the fourth year, compete in my state pageant, and lose. Go back the fifth year, compete in my state pageant, and lose. But guess what happens the sixth year? I lose. I called her on the phone six years after our target conversation. And I said, you told me I could be the next Miss USA. And she says, Deshauna, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. In June of 2015, this amazing kind of cuckoo woman passes away from leukemia. In December 2015, I win Miss District of Columbia, USA. In June 2016, I'm crowned the first soldier to win Miss USA. And last January in Manila, Philippines, I walked the Miss Universe stage and placed top nine amongst 86 countries. Do not fear failure, but please be terrified of regret. When you walk out this door into the real world, you will receive a lot of shut doors, a lot of turned down applications. You will hear way more no's than you hear yeses. Giving up is something I did a lot of growing up and I don't think I really challenged myself to stick anything through until I joined the track team in middle school. I remember having to ask my mom after tryouts and making it to the team for my very first pair of track shoes. Now at the time, she walks into our house and she has a bag that has a nice Nike check sign on it. So I get excited because I wasn't getting new shoes very often. I go to take the shoe box out the bag and I notice that it says a size nine on it. Mind you, in the seventh grade, I was a size five. 
I open the box and I slide my feet into the shoe and I look at my mother and I said, these shoes are too big. She says, I know I did that on purpose. I was like, why would you buy shoes that are too big on purpose, mom? And she says, because I know that you're going to grow into them. <sighs> Coach has us line up on the starting line and he wants us to run a lap around the track. As we go to take off, I immediately fall to the ground, twist my ankle because the shoes are entirely too big. See, I couldn't run at the speed that I wanted to because I didn't fit the shoes I was wearing at the time. Now, many of us have goals we're trying to achieve, but the person we are right now is not the person that we need to be when we cross the finish line to our dreams. So we must walk and pace ourselves on this journey to our goals because we haven't grown enough in ourselves to fit the shoes that we need to achieve our aspirations. But let me tell you something, if I had won Miss USA my very first year, I would not have been Miss USA. I would not have been the version of myself that I needed to be to properly handle a national title. Many of us aren't ready to walk the race, but understand that as we walk this race, we pace ourselves and as we pace ourselves we grow and as we grow our foot gets bigger and as our foot gets bigger our shoes begin to fill and as our shoes begin to fill we can now run a little bit faster and as we pick up the pace we get to the finish line at the exact time we are destined to cross it do not fear the word no but be afraid of the possibility of a yes that you have prematurely destroyed because you decided to quit before the clock strikes 12. There are a lot of questions that is going to keep you up at night, but I guarantee there isn't one question that will keep you up longer at night than the question, what if I didn't give up?